Okay. I think we will we will start. Uh, maybe we can uh, temporarily close a little bit the door. Not that we, we don't want anybody uh, else, but to have a broader. Uh, oh, am I alone? Here? <laughs> so, first of all, thank thank you all for for coming. Uh, my name is Bertrand Lachapelle. I'm the, the director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, and this is a um, this is a workshop that actually follows um, activities that we had this year in, in various meetings, and something that we started uh, with Paul Fellinger was over there doing the uh, uh, remote moderation um, that we started at the beginning of 2012. In a nutshell, this is a process that is uh, dedicated to addressing the tension between the cross-border nature of the internet and the patchwork of national jurisdictions. And uh, as a matter of fact, if, if some people want to, to come, this is a structure where it's not panelists on a panel, people are distributed, so if you want to come and fill the different seats that are, that are available, including here, you're welcome, don't hesitate. Um, so we started this thing two years ago, and uh, the challenge is the tension between the cross-border nature and the internet and the national jurisdictions. As a matter of fact, I want to take the opportunity of this uh, workshop as a starting point to identify how it fits into the general, the general process. We started that two years ago with fundamentally two legs. One is uh, an observatory that has now 25 people uh, in different uh, universities that are regularly crowdsourcing cases related to jurisdictional conflict between different uh, countries. And every month, there's a crowd ranking exercise that produces a um, newsletter of 20 cases. Every six months, there is a synthesis of trends coming out of those uh, cases. That's one part of the Internet and Jurisdiction uh, project. The other part is a dialogue facilitation, which is multi-stakeholder facilitation process, where the goal is to bring the different actors around the table from government, from civil society and the private sector, to discuss this tension, which is actually a common concern for all the different operators. And the way to organize this dialogue is something that we've developed progressively as the time evolved, as a combination of meetings that we participate in as the two facilitators, third party meetings that are organized, it can be local IGFs, it can be the, the global IGF, it can be uh, thematic meetings uh, of various sorts and in various places where basically we raise awareness and give feedback on the process. But the other part is meetings by invitation that are voluntarily limited in, in numbers to make sure that the discussion in one and a half day can be uh, intense and fruitful. And those meetings are gathering in different regions, the local government, including in many cases the law enforcement, uh, the civil society actors, technical community, um, businesses, and, um, uh, uh, and, and DNS operators. This year, we have organized, in that context, four meetings, four workshops. One in Brazil in May, one in Paris uh, in July for Europe, and one in... Um, Delhi in September and the last one in Washington in October as a preparatory process for this, uh, for this meeting at the IGF in, in Bali. One of the big challenges that actors are confronted with is the fact that a lot of 
operators are acting across borders and there is a growing challenge of what we call digital coexistence in shared online spaces of very different norms between the personal norms of individuals who are on the internet, who are in a growing number, but also more and more diverse, but also the legal norms of the countries that they live in. And so what we're trying to do with the project is to facilitate a discussion about this. We don't have a particular vision or agenda of a solution to propose, but the goal is to catalyze the discussion and the discussion has gone through various stages. The first year in 2012 was basically, what is the problem? Do we agree that there is a problem? And is there a way to frame the problem in the same manner among the different actors? And you will see on the, on the wall a certain number of questions, like what is the geography of cyberspace? Um, what are the transborder impacts and the exercise of sovereignty on other territories through their local operators. What are the frameworks that could be envisaged for various issues like uh, domain seizures, content takedown, and access to user data? Um, those questions have emerged from the discussion in 2012. <clears throat> and the outcome of these discussions at the end of 2012 was basically that the different actors, without getting into too much detail, shared a very strong message, which is, we have a common problem among law enforcement, among civil society groups, among platforms and DLS operators, which is the following. When we talk about domain seizures, content takedown, and access to user data, criminal investigations, for instance, there is no framework that exists today to ensure that there is fair process and efficiency. Usually it goes against one another. In most cases, for those of you who are not familiar with the way it works, in most cases, you can have efficiency. Somebody is picking up the phone, calling the DNS operator, the uh, platform in another country, and says, I have a problem with this content, or I have a problem with this actor. Can you cooperate? It's yes, no, but it's an informal network, a trust network. Works in some cases, doesn't work, relatively efficient, but no fair process guarantees on any side. On the other hand, you can have a pretty fair process guarantee. It's called a mutual legal assistance treaty. It's beautiful. The problem is that it is relatively long. And in the workshop that we had in, uh, in India, it explains that when you want to use a mutual legal assistance treaty for criminal investigation, the investigator needs to ask the Home Affair Ministry whether they can make a request. Then when the answer is yes, they can go to a court to validate this request. Then when the validation is done, they go back to the Home Ministry. Then the Home Ministry passes this to the Foreign Affairs Ministry, which sends it to the U.S. Uh, Department of State or any other country, which itself screens the request, brings it to the Department of Justice, which then goes to the, um, to the company beautiful fair process. I mean, there are all guarantees everywhere, 24 months on average, between the moment you make the request and you get the, the, the answer. So in between, there is this tension between efficiency and fair process. And the message at the end, to make a long story short, the message at the end of the first year was, how can we collectively develop procedural interfaces between those different actors, the triangle that you will uh, see inside this, this little brochure, how can we develop procedures to, develop, to, to organize this? <clears throat> and so what we want to do today is to, first we brought a certain number of people who have participated or have followed the, uh, the process uh, <clears throat> during the year. <clears throat> and I will uh, list them uh, briefly, no particular order. Sunil Abraham, who is here, is from uh, CIS, uh, Center for Internet and, and Society in, uh, in India. Anki, let, let, let me point to, to people and introduce yourself so that we can get in the flow. 
Hi, I'm Akhida from Facebook. And? I'm Carblon from OECD. Linda. Linda Corujeras Denever, European Commission. Okay. David Martineau, um, I represent the French government. Okay. Hi, Patrick Ryan from Google. Yeah. Jan Malinowski from the Council of Europe. Hi, Carlos Afonso Souza for the Rio de Janeiro Institute for Technology and Society. Uh, Henriette. Henriette Escherhuisen, Association for Progressive Communication. Um, Shimani, you can also. Chinmay Yaru from the Center for Communication Governance at National Law University, Delhi. Uh, who else has participated? Uh, Fiona has. Fiona Alexander from the US Department of Commerce. There are a few other people who are in this room who have looked at the, uh, the process or either participated and, and it is an open format. It's not a, a discussion that is presentations by uh, the panelists. What we want to do this, in this workshop today is just continue the process because it is not an event. It's an ongoing uh, exercise. And what we want to share is <clears throat> the outcome, the first outcome of those discussions has been to identify a certain number of components or building blocks that could help build a framework for interfacing the different actors. <clears throat> and although we're not in a classroom format, I would almost take a, a teacher position and say, could you please open your books at page two? <laughs> if you look at the brochures that you have on your, on your page, you will see on the, on the internal second page, sorry, on your desk, on the second page, there are six components that we've identified, or that the groups who have participated have identified as elements to develop a, uh, a, a framework to move forward. And in the second part of this, uh, of this workshop, we will get into more details in that, in that regard. But as a starting point, because I've already spoken too much, uh, I'd like to, to ask whether people who have participated in the, in the process or who have observed the, the, the process, or even any other participants looking at the topic, whether they want to chime in uh, regarding why, in their view, this issue is important. Why, why is it of concern? And basically, why did they uh, participate in the, uh, in the exercise? Who wants, to, who wants to start? It's always difficult to be the first one. Jan? Yes, why not? It is important because uh, <coughs> there is uh, a question of uh, rule of law, of applying the laws. There are legitimate interests that have to be pursued, and <coughs> there are human rights to be respected. There are tensions there that need to be resolved in practical terms in order to to, to be able to do what uh, society expects in, in this respect. There are uh, cyber crime issues, there are uh, civil law issues, there are a number of issues that need to, to have practical responses, uh, and they have to comply with the, with the major principles Yes, um, jurisdiction is what jurisdiction, jurisdiction is one of the most difficult issues we've tried to tackle <laughs> in different fora, including the OECD. So um, it's really important because the internet and internet policy and all the issues related to the internet are complex. It's really important to try to to get the actors um, to to discuss and to try to find practical ways, pragmatic ways, to, to solve a number of the conflicts. And because it's transnational, it's, it's a very interesting endeavor. It's going to be a long journey, but it's really interesting to, to follow that. It's some kind of soft law. It's not regulation. It's not self-regulation. It's inclusive. It's a new animal. <laughs> 
that you are creating, but that's really an important question. Um, APC has participated in, in this for two reasons, and, uh, and thanks to Ben Char for including us. The first is that we working um, have been and will continue for over the last few years on an electron electronically enabled violence against women. And this is a very tricky area. It's an emerging area of expression of violence against women. It involves various jurisdictions. It even involves different human rights and uh, freedom of expression. Um, and we are trying to come up with remedies that are legal and other forms of remedies um, that women who feel that they have been subjected to some form of electronically enabled violence um, can pursue. And doing this without resorting to censorship of certain types of content, um, which is the response in some parts of the world, is actually really complex. Um, and um, it also, of course, involves working with service providers as well as regulators, as well as with community groups who are trying to counteract um, um, violence against women. And in fact, we had a very interesting experience with Facebook this last year on the so-called Facebook rape issue. Then secondly, for us, it really, I think it's a model. Um, we're dealing with internet governance and we're dealing with trying to come up with enhanced cooperation, uh, more inclusive, uh, equal ways of um, of uh, doing internet governance in a multi-stakeholder context. And I, what I really like about this project is that it's taken a relatively narrow area of governance and jurisdictional problems. And it's had a very consultative research evidence-based um, process, um, which is now trying to come up with concrete solutions. And actually, I think that is what enhanced cooperation should be about. It shouldn't be about very general discussions about role of government um, at a generic level. I think it should be based on identifying particular gaps, particular problems, and then working out how they can be solved effectively. So I think it's a really valuable model for us in the IG sector as a whole. Linda. Thank you very much, Bill Now, and um, thank you for organizing this seminar. We have also had the benefits in Brussels of, uh, of your team to, to clarify a little bit of what the project is about, so that was very, very useful. I do agree very much with the colleague from the OECD that this is a very complex issue, for sure, but, but it's not the only transborder issue where we've had to create legislation that works. I mean, banking, health, etc., or other examples where, where it's been done. And I don't think it's valid anymore to say that the internet is so exceptional that it can't be done. We just have to, to uh, ramp up, I think, our international cooperation. But just to give you an example of how complicated this can be, for instance, the .eu domain, they, they uh, are under a EU directive of the e-commerce uh, uh, directive. But this directive is very general. So um, it, it's actually not giving that much guidance to them. And uh, there, if there is a concrete case of a takedown demand, they will also have to defer to the Belgium law because they're located in Belgium. So here you have a bit of, of a contradiction and, and uh, something that needs to be noted and studied. There is um, work going on in another director, director general, DG Markt, uh, so that's for the internal market. Uh, 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 on, on notice and, and action, but uh, we're, we're not ready yet because this is so complex. So I'm also here very much in a listening mode to hear what's going on in other places. So thank you very much. Uh, I have Sunil next, and then Carlos. Uh, uh, first, uh, perhaps the uh, private sector reason for why this is important, even though I'm from civil society. <laughs> Changing this, is, this, is, this is a bigger problem for s uh, certain governments and uh, uh, th th these governments address it through preferential market access. So if you don't trust telecommunication equipment that is produced uh, from a certain jurisdiction, then you ban it from your jurisdiction and other governments take exactly uh, that lead. So if uh, access to user information is complicated, then you ask for those service servers to be located within your jurisdiction 
so that it's subject to local regulation. And I'm not so certain preferential market access is a good thing for anybody. So uh, that is the private sector reason. Uh, the second, as I said, in Delhi, uh, civil society rationale is that I'm not, uh, I'm quite confused whether this is a bug or whether this is a feature, whether the lack of interoperability across jurisdictions is a good thing. And if I was a, a civil society activist, activist in India working on transparency and transparency activists are regularly killed in India, uh, whether two years will give me two more years of life, that might be a good thing in, in my <laughs> case. So. Uh, when uh, the private sector and the government are doing deals to increase interoperability, then I'd like to be uh, at the table because I wouldn't want the wrong type of interoperability. Thank you. Yeah, the tension between something that is too efficient, I, I don't remember who that was, but in one of the meetings, uh, somebody said something that is absolutely efficient becomes totalitarian. So <laughs> it's, it's uh, and I see nodding as uh, they say. Carlos. Just two quick notes. Uh, first of us, uh, first, first of all, to think about the situation of, especially Brazil, you know, what this type of discussion, it will be pretty much in interesting for, for the country itself, the single fact that uh, you have uh, today something around like uh, the second or the third uh, place in the ranking of the number of users for both uh, Facebook and Twitter being uh, Brazilian users. So. That itself, as, as well, as soon you said, I'm not with the private sector as well, but uh, <laughs> it seems like it would create an interesting for companies to, to take a look, uh, especially uh, companies that operate in a great amount of countries. So, of course, in like their operations in Brazil, it will be yeah. interesting to have some procedures that have been checked abroad and submitted to a large and open discussion, such as this one. Definitely, there will be something of value to, to be taken out of it. And especially for Brazil, and uh, not only for Brazil, but for all developing countries, we have this tradition of import uh, models that have been uh, applied abroad. So in this sense, it is as well something important for us to have a, a larger discussion on those uh, processes, on those building blocks, and the six uh, components that you mentioned here, because it would be interesting to see that discussion being led in, in a way in which we got the input from different stakeholders, it's definitely something, I would say, that puts uh, legislators and law enforcement agents in a developing country in a much better uh, secure place to adopt this procedure rather than simply import one or other uh, option that had been applied abroad in this or that country. So, just a couple of thoughts about uh, yeah, there's the question. Uh, there's the question of, of importing, but also the question of even even if you develop it on on a local basis, if it is done without any communication with what other countries are developing at the same time, then everybody ends up with a patchwork of rules that are even harder to enforce and to uh, accommodate because they are now more and more incompatible instead of being just difficult to harmonize. If I, if I, thank you. Uh, thank you. What, the reason why we participated was, uh, of course, to understand uh, gaps in the current infrastructure in the India meeting, particularly what was very interesting that we had people from law enforcement agencies participating. And uh, we, of course, knew this, but what was uh, helpful in that discussion was the ability to discuss the current gaps in the MLAT uh, process, and most of it was infrastructural deficiencies which we felt uh, the consensus in the room was that it could have it could be addressed by making sure that that infrastructure aspect was addressed for example a long standing demand in india has been that there should be an mlat desk uh, uh, with with uh, you know with uh, with partners with uh, with countries uh, which have a lot of these services uh, uh, you know who they are offering which they are offering in india particularly the us and that hasn't happened so there are a lot of gaps in the bilateral arrangements which would address would definitely deal with the um, concerns which is there. So it's not as if the current uh, mechanisms are broken. There are solid amounts of inefficiencies in that. And it became a 
very interesting place to have that uh, discussion uh, in, in, a, in a very practical sort of way. Second uh, aspect of, our, uh, of the reason why we kind of participate is that we are, as private sector, we are interested in participating in any discussion on future innovative instruments as you talk about. And uh, therefore, I think one of the elements which we were interested to explore is that can there be consensus on a principles-based approach which various governments could agree to from a, from a jurisdiction treatment perspective. And, and therefore, that was our interest to intervene and participate in those uh, discussions. Thank you. Shumai. Not sure whether there's someone from a government here since uh, most of you decided to do a let's talk for the corporate angle. I thought that <laughs> let me uh, attempt to uh, to suggest how this is good for government. I think that sometimes we make the mistake of um, of homogenizing the way in which we think about government. And in India, in particular, we know that there are multiple channels through which takedown requests or access to data requests can be made. And so it is not necessarily true that the people that make the rule and then the people that are um, that are officially responsible for uh, for following it are really able to track the minutiae of how it's being followed. So a system like this would create internal accountability and would help them track both through traceability and um, through safeguards uh, what people within the system are treating the rule in which way. And it would help filter out both ignorance because I'm assuming that, uh, that the standards that are created would um, would clarify to people what is acceptable and what is not. And it will also remove malafide requests, which are also a range of requests that, that happen. Um, yeah, I, I, and in terms of the clear signaling, I think that I would echo what Anki says, which is that I think that with this whole multi-jurisdictional system, part of the problem is that it must be very hard for companies to figure out what is legitimate in which jurisdiction. And so in that sense, a system like this would, would just give helpful information that helps people be more efficient. One thing I picked from, from what you're, you're saying before giving the floor to Dr. Fiona is the, uh, the diversity of actors when we say government. Inside governments, there are very different agencies, there are very different, not only ministries, but you have law enforcement agencies on one hand, you have the data protection authorities on the other, you have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you have the Ministry of Justice, you have the Ministry of uh, Economy, and they sometimes have very legitimate divergent rationales and drivers. And one of the things that we've tried, and I think it has worked so far pretty well, is to try to get also the different dimensions. Having a prosecutor, uh, for instance, in, in the Brazil meeting, uh, somebody from the uh, Central Bureau of Investigation in, uh, in India, people from Europol in, uh, in Europe. And this brings a completely different dimension to the, to the discussion. Thank you. Just maybe to um, echo a little bit of what Henri had said, which what I find most interesting, or one of the things I find interesting about this particular uh, effort, is that it's so evidence-based, and it get, lets us get at real issues. I think we've spent the last several years talking about principles and agreeing to a variety of principles in different fora, and this takes us to the next level. And you know, a lot of credit to, to Bertrand and Paul for surfacing this at the IGF a few years ago, having a workshop, taking the time to go around the world and bring stakeholders together in their own countries, and then that lets you see the commonality, which you don't often get when you have much more higher level discussions. So this has really allowed for local discussions at a more detailed level to really see what the trends are across, and it really is kind of implementation of a lot of the principles, and I think very useful next step for a lot of this. Yeah, I'll, I'll open briefly uh, around for also other actors to, to, to chime in, please. Uh, Vinayak from Data Security Council of India. Sorry? Vinayak from Data Security Council of India. So there are two reasons basically. One is uh, the companies have obligations, uh, legal obligations to local uh, jurisdictional uh, laws and regulations. If they go to something like cloud computing, so what will happen to their obligations to cloud computing? So for example, uh, they have to support the law enforcement requirement for investigation purposes. So what will happen, suppose their operations are being handled by cloud computing, so this one. Another reason is we, we work with law enforcement agencies in India in their capacity building program and we support uh, in training purposes and in investigation support purposes also. And many times they struggle, both the law enforcement agencies and the judiciary, judiciary also, they struggle 
uh, to get resolved if the case involves majoration problems. So for those three reasons that we participated in the little discussion. Thank you very much. Are there any, any comments in, in the room? I know Henriette wants to say something, Jan. Any, anybody else in the room wants to chime in on basically the, the, the topic and the, and the issues? Uh, and then we'll move to the different deliverers and Patrick. So Jan, Jan, Henriette, and Patrick. Yes, uh, my, my initial comment was very general, and uh, we seem to have already moved into into more specific areas. If we talk in the in respect of the specifics, I think that we have to make certain distinctions. There is the um, decision of the operators. There are some operators that have editorial responsibility and editorial power over their content. And uh, they exercise it in their own ways. And the ways that they do it today are different to the ways that they were exercised in the past with legacy media, newspapers, things like that. So you have Facebook or Twitter that have, or a Google, that have a different way of exercising editorial control, editorial process, uh, and they have certain scope of decision, and they will decide on content, and they will decide on content sometimes depending on the territory where they are disseminating certain, uh, certain content. It is provided by users, it is provided by other actors, fine, but they are the editors of that, they are the curators of that content. Now, that is one thing. Then <coughs> there, there is the question of uh, the territory and the laws which apply in that territory. In that respect, there is sovereignty. Yet states have committed to certain values. Most of the countries in the world have committed to the Universal Declaration of human rights. Uh, 160 something countries have committed to the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which has its equivalent in Europe in the European Convention on Human Rights. The difference is that in the European context, that carries an enforceability mechanism that goes with it. If <coughs> states can be brought to account for their performance in respect of human rights before the European Court of Human Rights. So that introduces a higher level of observance and accountability in respect of those rights. Uh, there is another principle that comes in, which is the non-interference with the sovereignty of other countries. So if decisions within one jurisdiction can have an impact on content, or expression, or privacy, which is the duty of another country to supervise control or ensure, as would be the case in Europe, then that introduces an entirely different dimension. At the same time, around the table there have already been comments in respect of law enforcement, for example. We have an instrument in respect of law enforcement, which is the Cybercrime Convention has been uh, adhered to ratified by a number of countries, uh, both uh, within Europe and uh, uh, growing so outside of Europe. But the standard that has been set by the <coughs> Cybercrime Convention has been used in more than 100 countries in order to align cybercrime <coughs> legislation. And the, the Cybercrime Convention has certain elements of uh, enforcement, of, of cooperation, mutual legal assistance. Uh, there, there's a network of 24-7 for uh, rapid assistance, for ensuring evidence, digital evidence, and so on and so forth. So we have all these things, and they are subject to rule of law, and they are subject to human rights principles. And uh, as I said, the fact that <coughs> in certain jurisdictions, the enforceability and the accountability of the state in respect of human rights is higher. Doesn't mean that the standard is different in other countries that have committed to the same 
values and principles through other global instruments. One, one thing that's, uh, before I, I, I give the floor to Henriette and Patrick and we move to the next stage, uh, two things I want to emphasize in terms of methodology. So one, everything that we're discussing within the framework of this project is not a replacement for existing modalities of interaction, either at the treaty level or at the judiciary level in each country and so on. It is a way to identify where procedures can become both efficient and uh, accountable and, and fair to facilitate the treatment of a growing number of cases. So it's not a replacement, it's a complement. The second thing which is important, and I was happy to hear some of the, uh, of the issues, is as facilitators, we're exactly this, we're a facilitator uh, team to help people discuss the different components that should be uh, put in place. Henriette, you wanted to chime in on, some, on one of the content, uh, briefly, uh, and, and Patrick. I actually wanted to ask some more challenging questions now. So, um, uh, you know, of you, of the project, and everyone else in the room. I mean, the first one is really I've spent years working in telecommunications policy, and we use the term harmonize. So um, I'll use it for want of a better word. Um, propose to harmonize these agreements that will emerge from this process with existing rights frameworks, maybe. Jan, you were beginning to touch on that. Um, and then secondly, how does one avoid, with, even with the best of intentions, an initiative like this becoming a little bit like some of the bilateral or small group country agreements we've seen in trade and in intellectual property enforcement, for example, which can become very exclusive and very limiting and um, difficult to, to penetrate and difficult to change. So how do you avoid that? this, this this method resulting in that. And then um, thirdly, um, what happens when there is no rule of law um, and when the, or when the underlying legislative framework is really flawed? I'm referring here specifically to the African Union cyber crime um, legislation that's being developed at the moment which really is alarming when it comes to, to the, the lack of protection for, for free speech. And yet that is now the legal framework that um, 50 countries in Africa are using for their cyber crime legislation. So, so and, and it's really flawed, there's poor rule of law, what then? And then lastly, I really like the whole, you know, your triangular diagram, uh, states, operators, and users. But do you think, it, what are the challenges around really effectively operationalizing, not the role of government, but the power of users? Um, how will users really, because it, it is still quite a complex framework, and I think it needs to be, because it's dealing with complex issues, as Anne Kaislang has said. But what does that mean for users, and, and for users' uh, capacity to, to express and, and maintain um, their rights? Thank you, Henriette. I couldn't imagine a better segue to the two sections uh, afterwards. Uh, Patrick, you wanted to, to chime in and I'll come back to the question. Thank you. Why is Google involved in this process? Well, one, because it's a really fun, difficult, hard problem that's really hard to solve, and uh, I'm glad you're tackling it. If, uh, you know, as a U.S. company with global operations, uh, you know, when it comes to a conflict, when there's an issue, tend to try to rely on the MLAT process, and the MLAT process is absolutely broken. Uh, it depends on, uh, well, first of all, no two countries have the same MLAT. Uh, the process of the way they work and are administered depends on the status of international politics as it does as uh, much with um, individuals who just happen to know the system. Um, there are many countries, significant ones, that don't have MLAT, right? And so what happens is when there's a, you know, Jan mentioned the criminal investigation, and when, when there's something that's hot, and there's a, and everybody sort of turns to the MLAT process, and they look at this thing, and there's no clear answer, or a very frustrating long answer, and everything, and everything just sort of becomes a mess. Uh, just imagine who's upset. Our users are upset because they believe that they want to be protected by their own government. Uh, you know, it's, 
civil society finds frustration and they want to get certainty on certain human rights issues and they're just not clear. And then the governments are very upset and a lot of them are very upset with the, with the U.S. position on, on, on a lot of these things because it comes back to a, to a very unilateral, um, uh, in many ways, a unilateral uh, approach that isn't unique to just the United States. Many countries do that, but uh, uh, it's certainly, uh, certainly there. So please do harmonize this, uh, uh, Bertrand. I'm, I'm disappointed that you're not creating a replacement system because uh, we need it. <laughs> <laughs> so you wanted to say yes. something. Th thank you, Bertrand. I think Zaid uh, for the transcript. Uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good idea. Uh, we've heard about the Council of Conventional, the Budapest Convention, which I think is more global than just European. It's been adopted across. It's not a regional one. And I, and I think that, you know, when you look at a convention like that, and, and let me first explain why I'm sort of going to talk about it a bit. Um, we have a lot of countries basically saying, I don't have a problem in my, in my jurisdiction, which is cross-border, and I don't know how to solve it. And maybe the answer go is, I need to go to an international forum and to be upset about it. That's, that's one way to do it. But then you ask yourself, well, are you the, creating the problem yourself? by not joining these structures that exist. They're faster than the MLAT structure, which is definitely broken, Patrick, I absolutely agree with you. And so you have a convention which has a 24-7 network. You have an MLAT provision which is faster, it has preservation, real-time uh, collection, etc. A lot of different things that are in that convention. And the point is that it lays down principles. It is not giving you details in that convention, for instance, about how you would apply it. So there's, there's room there that needs to clarification, especially for developing countries. If I sign on to this convention, what does it mean for me in detail? It is a convention which has trans transporter access provisions as well, which is, which is exactly what developing countries want because they want the data from, from say, Google, Yahoo, or Facebook. But they want to do it through a framework, and they don't want, you know, the providers don't want to cooperate unless they have a framework in which they can feel secure cooperating. And then it has a very important aspect, and we have just meant to mention this issue of human rights. Article 15 of the convention deals with safeguards. It mentions the uh, civil political, uh, the international government civil political rights and the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but it doesn't mean, it, you can't by reading that article know what does that mean? Does it mean, is it a warrant process? Do we have judicial oversight or, or administrative oversight? What exactly does that mean? So while we have these principles enshrined in the, in the treaty, and I think it's a good thing it's, it's at principle level, your project can help try to build consensus around what do these things in detail mean. And so create more efficiency, more understanding, maybe more harmonization. So yeah, I don't know about re necessarily replacing, but I think it's a, it's a good second, you know, best at replacing in, in a sense and facilitating this. Because at the end of the day, I think for businesses and users, what you want is certainty. And you get that through what you're trying to do next. Or at least predictability. David. And uh, briefly, and we'll move to the next phase because time is unfortunately uh, uh, very hard. Go ahead. So, so briefly, why we like and why we support the project is that it aims at concluding, <laughs> as Notably opposed by to ongoing by and exactly. everlasting process. It aims at concluding by making proposals, and, and that's what we like. Um, our concern is that we we need a lot to be enforced. And, and I, I may not say that MLAT system, the MLAT system is broken, but I, I would say that it is not efficient enough, not fast enough, and it's not comprehensive. So, uh, <laughs> our concern. <laughs> okay. Can but I beyond <laughs> that, <laughs> we speak the same language. It's okay. <laughs> um, we could hire you. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. So. Can you cut that for the <laughs> So, the thing is, is uh, our question is how do we make it work? Because law enforcement agencies are under huge pressure. They need results, they need to catch the bad guys who run fast. And, and that's why we need to have a comprehensive system of, of MLAP and why we need to have them not rely entirely on trust and international friendship. And I say that because at the Paris meeting, maybe it's not my duty to say that, but uh, somebody from from Europol uh, came up with a, a 
that's the kind of view, and I think that's the kind of view that you should explore more. But maybe you, you better present. Uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, the uh, the interesting thing, and people who participated in the India uh, meeting can also testify in that regard. It was for me a fascinating uh, element in the process that the presence of people who are actually dealing with the concrete issues, like the law enforcement people and prosecutors and so on, has added a tremendous impetus in terms of orienting things towards the reality. And I, w I would say one thing, the word uh, sovereignty has been, uh, has been mentioned. There is always a debate when we're talking, and I, I will use this as a segue for the, the second part and the building blocks. Especially in the IGF and in other spaces, there's this whole debate about sovereignty in the digital age. Is sovereignty disappearing, or is it necessary to reaffirm sovereignty in the digital age? The fact is that it's neither, not one or the other. Sovereignty is essential. There's no doubt that if you have a country that has no government functioning, we see that in failed states, the situation is awful. You need law enforcement, you need processes at the national level, you need frameworks, you need enabling frameworks, you need everything. The challenge that we're confronted with, and that is at the core of the discussion here, is that if you are, for instance, I give the example, in a situation where there's a Frenchman in France, insulting another Frenchman in French through Twitter, the likelihood is that it's going to be French law. <laughs> Simple, you don't need an international treaty to handle this, really. If on the other hand, to make things a little bit complex, you get an Australian traveling in Ecuador using a Yandex to uh, insult a, a, a Brazilian who is actually traveling elsewhere, if you take the time to identify which jurisdiction is going to be, not to mention where the servers of the company are located, by the way, uh, this becomes more complex. And it becomes more complex because, to become serious again, the traditional way of saying there, is a, there should be a rule for attributing jurisdiction, and a simple rule that would be working in all cases, you get two tensions. You get one who says the rule of the person who is actually using the internet should be the rule of jurisdiction, which basically means that anything that is published in one country should be respecting 190 laws regarding publication. And the reverse can lead to certain extremes where if it is the law of the country of incorporation of the company, it is an extraterritorial extension of the sovereignty of that company, uh, of that country on the citizens in other territories. So there are many cases where, because it is shared spaces, it is not about deciding whether it's the sovereignty of A or the sovereignty of B. It's how do you combine those sovereignties, which is something that is extremely difficult to do in the traditional intergovernmental space, because the traditional intergovernmental relationship is based on you don't mingle in my affairs and I won't mingle in yours, which is completely different from how do we work together to handle issues in shared spaces. So this as a transition to, to highlight that the idea of developing a framework of having actors discuss those procedures led to six components, building blocks, if you want. And I would like to take a few minutes to just briefly describe those six uh, components. Again, to put that in, in context, what we're dealing with here is situations where there are requests for domain seizures, content takedown, or access to user data across borders. The topic is not to deal with relationship between the national authorities and the national operators. It may apply, but that's not the, the purpose because this is supposed to be covered by the national legislation, whatever. So the six building blocks are the following. One is authentication. There's a law enforcement that is making a request, for instance, or any other actor a platform or an operator of the NS received this request, how do you know that it is indeed the law enforcement agency of Lizito that is making this request and not somebody who is pretending to be that? How do you know that the person who is making the request has the right hierarchical level to make that type of request? 
how do you know that the request has actually been made following the actual law existing in that given country? That's one authentication. It's a form of naming and addressing, and one of the typical cases is people are using in law enforcement sometimes email addresses that are Gmail or Yahoo accounts. Okay, so how you make sure that this is the right interlocutor on the other side? <laughs> Um, second thing is transmission. As we said earlier, requests are being transmitted today either informally through phone calls and trust networks, without fair process, sometimes efficiently, or through a very lengthy fair process or at least documented process, uh, but it can go through the diplomatic pouch in an airplane, actually going physically from one uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs to another. In between, there are many ways to transmit this information from the requester to the recipient. It can go, first of all, with should there be or could there be an agreed format for making those requests, like the equivalent of tags or fields or things that describe the sender, the type of the request, the nature of the uh, of the base law, and so on, so that there's an agreed protocol to understand what the request is. And second, what is the routing mechanism? There are many options, and at this moment, there is no, uh, we haven't gone in the process at the level of detail of picking one option versus others. But for instance, you can go from one extreme centralization that would be a global international portal for putting all those requests to the completely decentralized system that would combine what some actors like Facebook or other platforms already have, like their own portal for interaction with governments, to intermediaries that go through Europol or any others, third-party systems. You can have very different modalities, but what is the mechanism that routes the, the request? Knowing that, to be frank, we're touching upon something that is extremely sensitive, and we shouldn't shy away from recognizing that this is sensitive. It is not the tradition, nor the existing legal framework, to enable the law enforcement or any actor in one country to directly interact with an actor in another country. It is supposed to go through an appropriate intergovernmental layer. And if we want to explore, for matters of efficiency, a direct relationship, this goes to a lot of fair process validation components, which we have to discuss. So routing and, and transmission is second. Third one, we labeled after the discussions under the term traceability. Traceability covers a certain number of things. How do you produce transparency reports that are accurate? To give you a very concrete element, when somebody in a platform in, in the US, for instance, receives a request from the Department of Justice to take down something or, or uh, give access to user data, it is not indicated whether this is a request from the US or whether it is a request that comes through an MLAT from another country. So if you get a transparency report, you have a certain level of requests that come from the US, but actually a certain number of them are coming from another country. Regarding transparency report producing, is this are these numbers produced only by one actor? So is it only by the um, platforms that report how many re requests they, respond, they receive? Or is it a joint declaration where the governments themselves or the public actors themselves say, these are the requests we've made? Another question regarding traceability is, how are requests logged, particularly when they're not public, to enable any sort of audit or ex post oversight to ensure that there's no abuse of, the, some, of some procedures. Big question marks on each of these blocks, but traceability is of course connected with transmission because depending on what you choose as a transmission mechanism, traceability is easier, more complex, or, or not. So that, these are the three first elements. The three last are determination i.e. who decides to accept or not accept a request. Today, it is mostly the operator who is receiving the request, the 
DNS operator, ISP platforms, and they have to make the determination, which is a problem for everybody. It's a problem because it is a little bit strange for community in general to see a private actor making something that amounts in certain respect to a quasi-judiciary decision. Yes, this content is Yes, this uh, data is being given. But the problem is that if you ask, and this was a very strong message from the platforms themselves, uh, and if I'm uh, misquoting or mis-expressing, correct me, but the message was we don't want as platform to be doing those determinations because it is a burden. It is, it is a burden and it's typically a situation of damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you do give some of the data, for instance, you would be accused of having cooperated with some actors who are not following due process. But if you don't, you get your own people on the ground that may be thrown in jail because you didn't comply with the court order, that sort of thing. The question is, in determination, and I'm trying to go fast because I'm taking too much time, but when you get to, the, to, to determination, the natural fair process guarantee is court. The problem is that it's not completely scalable. It's not scalable in terms of handling every single small component of privacy data or content. But it is not scalable also because you, again, have to determine which court. Is it the validation by the court of the mission or the court on the other side? And so, if it is not a court, are there third-party validation mechanisms that may be trusted enough? And the two last ones are safeguards regarding user uh, protection. When and why is the request notified to the user or not? When should it not be notified? When should it be notified? And when it is notified, are there contradictory procedures that allow the user concerned to respond? And uh, are there appeal mechanisms? And finally, last but not least, under the label execution, if all the boxes have been ticked and there is a decision that there should be a content takedown, that there should be a domain seizure, that there should be access to user data, how you do it technically is not neutral. You can either take down a domain or seize a domain and do it in a way that harms the infrastructure or not. You can take down content very locally or absolutely globally. And the granularity of the decision is a very important element. And in access to user data, there's the question of do you give the needle or the haystack? So this is a bit of a long presentation, but the purpose of this, of this uh, session at the IGF is to, to bring the different actors up to speed when they have not participated in the, uh, in the process so far. And the challenge, and I think I will, I will wrap and bring the, the, the last 20, 25 minutes uh, around, around this, this question. These are the six building blocks that we have identified at the outset of the process uh, or by the participants as potential components to develop a regime. The goal is to continue next year and get into the actual development of an operational framework. I have two questions for the, the, the main participants and the rest of the audience. One is, are those building blocks more or less covering the, the right issues? Are there contributions that you want to make that we can take all into account in the rest of the process, knowing that we would love to spend the whole day in the workshop, but it's not possible. But the second issue is more um, important and connected to what Henriette was saying before regarding um, uh, inclusion or avoiding a small group country. We are collectively confronted with one very classical problem, which is how do you continue this exercise, both deepening and broadening? We want to engage more actors, but at the same time, we want to go in more operational aspects. So how to make sure that the process involves actors in other regions, and at the same time, can, can work deeper. We will have a, um, a, a meeting, in any case, in March, 
in Paris to bring the different actors so far who have participated together and others. How to continue the discussion next year is also what, what I would like to, to, to hear about. So sorry for having been a little bit long, but it was to just bring the, uh, the presentation up to, to speak for other actors. Jan, you wanted to chime in and answer me. Yes, I, I, I would start by saying that the, <coughs> the six uh, are mostly uh, procedural. They are the practicalities that one has to comply with uh, in order, and, and they have to respect uh, the rule of law requirements in order to be consistent with uh, human rights principles and so on. We have already heard that the 24-7 arrangements that have been created in connection with cybercrime. There are <coughs> guidelines that have been uh, adopted in uh, connection with uh, relations between ISPs and law enforcement agencies, and all of that seeks to give response to the specific questions that you were asking. I think, personally, that one has to rise to another level first in order to be able to respond to these things, you have to think in terms, for example, concerning uh, uh, privacy and data protection and access to personal data. You have to have a human rights compliant system. And that requires, to start with, take account of international law. You have in international law, in the ICDPR, you have Convention 108, you have Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights and so on. There are a number of things that stem from that. There should be no access, there should be no surveillance without a law that specifically provides for it. The law has to be clear enough to uh, make the provisions and the application of the law uh, perfectly foreseeable. Someone has to be able to say, to me, this will apply in this particular way. That is a clear law. There can be no general surveillance. There can be no a priori general data retention. There has to be a strict case-by-case -case decision in respect of, of access, and it should have a judicial component to it. It doesn't mean that there has to be a judge, but it has to be it concerns fundamental rights, and fundamental rights cannot be put aside by decision of someone. It has to be by decision of an authority that has been entrusted with judicial functions. So in, in, we know that in, in that context, there are different types of, of panels and, and, uh, and uh, uh, bodies that have a judicial role. How, being sorry to interrupt you, but how would that incorporate, for instance, uh, the use or not use of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, panels that would be ad hoc built for uh, a case-by-case -case analysis or permanently based? I, I don't know. Should it necessarily uh, use existing judicial uh, adjudication uh, mechanisms, or is there a room for new new mechanisms? There is certainly room for, for developing that. We, we are talking about something that can involve a significant amount of numbers that would simply drown the, the legal system that we know that we have good. today. So, so one has to think uh, differently. But that has been accepted. There are cases where the human rights case law except that not judges who have been attributed judicial functions to perform uh, those functions in compliance with human rights. Uh, but there needs to be an agreement that these are the appropriately trusted actors to make a determination or so. Yes. Patrick, but you want to chime in on, on this one? Because I think there are other uh, elements that require to be complied with in order to give a system that... that uh, but if I'm, if I'm understanding yeah. correctly, this is the... Uh, these are the components that have been listed in 
the, uh, the work of the Council of Europe regarding what is necessary, right? What would be the document of the Council of Europe that would embody those different criteria? There isn't a single document. There are a number of different documents that respond to that, that interpret the human rights in the online environment. Uh, they, they respond to specific issues uh, okay. in particular context. But, but the, the, I think that the framework exists. One simply has to, to read it and understand it, and, uh, and that the, the, the practical arrangements need to be developed further in order to ensure that we do it the right way, that we do it while respecting uh, human rights uh, requirements, and at the same time that we do it efficiently in this new environment that requires the speed and the, and the responsiveness that the traditional systems do not necessarily have. But I think that we have advanced a fair amount on, on, on those fronts. Okay. I have... Um, <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I try, I try, I try. So I was Michael. Uh, thank you, Michael Yakushov, uh, PR Center, uh, Moscow, Russia. Uh, I will be very brief, and I would say um, that the answer to your first question is yes. <laughs> so it's acceptable uh, to continue with these six components. They are good, and uh, of course, it's possible to go deeper and to discuss each of them. Uh, separately, but uh, I think it's not an appropriate place to do so. But as for what to do next, I would say that uh, uh, talking about uh, jurisdiction, we will inevitably t touch uh, the governments, their law, uh, legal framework, etc. So uh, uh, my question, is not maybe the answer, but my question to you as uh, the project, whether it's a high time now uh, to start talking about not only soft law, which would just uh, solve some issues that were raised, but also to go to the hard law, like international convention, that would uh, solve part of these issues based, for example, on these six components. There uh, appear uh, when uh, internet appeared and the issues that we are now talking about appeared, it gave a new dimension uh, to the international regulation. Uh, the way that uh, previously it was only one territorial dimension when we talked about the jurisdiction and sovereignty. Now we have other types of uh, dimensions of the regulations like human rights, and of course, uh, the internet is kind of a new dimension here, and I think it should be regulated not only on the level of national governments and national legislations, but also on the higher level of international law. So my proposal would be to be prepared to move further and not only uh, limiting ourselves to the soft law as the, the Council of Europe, for example, does, but also to think about how it could, how it could be described in the terms of international uh, legal tool. Thank you. Thank you. I will, I will continue, uh, but it turns out that it's, it's, uh, it's appropriate to keep your question and if the different uh, interventions afterwards want to also say whether they think it's the right approach or, or not, it, it would be great. I had Linda. Thank you, Bertrand. Well, um, for the components, I think they are good. Uh, they need to be uh, put some meat on the bone, yes. for sure. But, but the I skeleton is okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're good. And that leads me to, to uh, one of the comments uh, that Henrietta, Henrietta made. And that is that um, I do agree that users' rights need to be substantially improved. That's part of the safeguard issue, so, so that we need to keep in mind. But this is complex, and, and just to mention then that equally troubling for us is that it's extremely difficult for providers to give their customers accurate and adequate notice on the conditions under which their data might be accessed by law enforcement. So this is, you know, um, uh, further complicating matters. I would also like to mention something that has so far not been mentioned, and that's cloud computing. Because if uh, uh, cloud is to realize its full potential, uh, we need significant law reform efforts in order to pr provide consistency and predictability to foster the confidence in this inevitable extension of the technology for data storage and access. We have made a first attempt to deal with this, the first policy uh, response, and that's our communication on unleashing the 
potential of cloud computing in Europe. Uh, and here we actually underline the, the problems of jurisdiction and, and applicable law in areas such as model contract terms and conditions and data protection, of course. And um, the solution need to, to encompass far-reaching international dialogue with third countries. We are already working with the US and Japan on coordinating legal and technical issues related to the future of cloud computing, so we have already started this process. Thank you. Cloud is definitely a word that is, that is taken into account. Hi, Malcolm. Um, thank you, Bertrand. I'm Malcolm Khatsi from the London Internet Exchange, and um, may I say that I think this process is a excellent process, there's been a really good discussion, but I think that at the heart of this there is a fundamental lack of clarity about what we're talking about here, so at least on my part, when we're talking about what kind of process we're talking about, when we're talking about a fair process, are we talking about essentially an administrative process or a quasi-judicial process, or some nature, or to put it another way, are we looking about how to bring about an outcome across borders? Or are we looking to enforce a law against someone? Now, is there a person whose interests are actually being implicated that might need to be balanced against a request? Now, if we're talking about hmm, disclosing that person's data, do they have a privacy interest that m might be a qualified right to not disclose it? They might have advocated that right through their actions, but nonetheless it is there and it needs to be determined whether or not. Um, similarly, if it's a if it's material that's been published and somebody's saying, take it down, this is wrong, yeah. um, do they have a, a right to say, well, no, I want this up and it's right that it shouldn't stay up? And if so, how is that, more particularly for this process, how are those rights intended to be protected? Are they intended to be protected by the national sovereign mechanisms of the entity making the request? In which case it's kind of an administrative process. Yeah, and you assume that it's already been determined that this is wrong and this is against the law table, and therefore the process is simply one to bring about the outcome of giving effect to that decision. Or is this a quasi-judicial process, in which case it's not assumed that, and it's yet to be determined. And I'm not clear from this what's being mentioned, because a lot of the language in this section, talking about um, particularly the emphasis on the credentials of the person making the request, um, the um, idea of um, compliance with the request, the, the determination stage and the language of that tends to suggest that it's actually a million administrative process, but this is actually just about bringing about an outcome. Okay. But on the other hand, the language of fair process in the very title um, suggests to me that actually what we're talking does, about... Does, does, the, uh, does the, the part that deals with safeguards and notification uh, and... Um, and um, contradictory procedures and so on, doesn't it cover most of what you're saying? Because well, well, we're clearly I'm, in a situation I'm, I'm where not it's sure. not one jurisdiction or the other that will have to... I, 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 I mean, in principle, the issues that are raised in the safeguard section might end up doing so. Okay. But the way that this is being presented, I mean, even those safeguards would be the kind of things uh, presented as being safeguards in a process that is ongoing, i.e. it's going to essentially okay. a determined outcome. Suggest to me the sort of thing I'd expect. Let me rephrase. Let me rephrase to see if if I understand correctly, and you tell me if, I, if I'm wrong. If we call it safeguards, it means that it seems to be an afterthought. Like there are things that prevent this thing from going in the wrong direction. Whereas what you meaning, and I think goes in what Henriette is saying, and and Linda also before, is that it's an integral part of the process to have those steps in as opposed to be something that prevents it from going in the wrong direction. I, I would I actually go even further than that. Okay. I would say that the determination step, yeah. as you label it, yeah. if it is considered a quasi-judicial process, actually this is all focused and comes into the decision, should we or should we not take this action? Whereas everything else about the way that this has been written is suggestive that the action is being sought and maybe there may be reasons you know, the safeguards may be reasons when, in exceptional cases, that is to be avoided. Okay. So, but let actually, me it, the idea that there's a neutral thing, that it might very well, in one case, be, yes, the action should be get, taken, mm. and in other cases, no, it shouldn't, with no sense of predisposition in the process itself. If we're going to have a quasi-judicial process, it needs to look like that. If it's administrative, that's not appropriate. Okay. Let me, let me uh, uh, shorten, shorten this, but uh, I wanted to 
jump on this one second uh, and one move. What you're describing is actually making me think, sorry for thinking uh, out of, uh, on the fly. In the six blocks, there's actually a chain whereby authentication is the initiation, execution is the end of the chain, and you have in, in the middle two connected boxes that are not, that are somehow like this. One is transmission and traceability together, and the other one is determination and safeguards as the procedure, whether it is quasi-judiciary, administrative, and so on. Just, just as a suggestion, we'll test that further in, in the discussion, but thanks for the, the contribution. I want to move, uh, because we're, we're nearing the end, and uh, let me ask all the different uh, next speakers that we go through the list to give an indication in their uh, comments whether uh, they are interested, willing uh, to participate in the meetings that we will organize uh, <laughs> next year. So I have in, uh, in my list, I have, uh, sorry, I don't remember your name. You were next on the, uh, on the list. Then I have, yes, then I have Sunil, Henriette, Patrick, Zahid, Carlos, David, and the gentleman over there, and Anne Carblon. So, and we have three minutes, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> So we will expand just a, a little bit if you are not bored yet. Um, please, I, I had, uh, please. Hello, uh, Louise Bennett from the BCS. Um, I, I think there's an element that's perhaps missing from, from this. I realize it's meant to be uh, about uh, human rights mainly and personal data and so on. But I think there's also an important element in a lot of this of consumer rights between countries. And I think that is a big concern of many users. They're, they're, they're frightened of um, uh, doing commerce across borders because they don't know whose jurisdiction they're in. And, and so I think you need to bring in an element here um, of consumer rights as, as well as fundamental human rights. Thank you. Uh, the next question, yeah. If um, this was a process led by Andreas and Carlos and Chinmay and myself, uh, we wouldn't call it uh, domain seizure, content takedown, and access to information. We'd call it uh, uh, transnational censorship. <laughs> and uh, uh, if you think through those categories, three areas very carefully, uh, the target of the increased interoperability in regulation is uh, the users, uh, citizens, uh, and consumers, mostly. Uh -huh. uh, you rarely hear of uh, take the government website being taken down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so therefore, uh, then you move into the components, and if you were to uh, structure it against a grid, whether each stakeholder played a passive or active role against each of those components, you will find that the consumer or citizen plays an active role only in safeguards particularly in the right of response and appeal mechanism. The story begins with other stakeholders, the story ends with other stakeholders. Somewhere in the middle, we make what in cinema is called a guest appearance. Uh, okay. so, uh, to use the weasel word, it's the wrong term here, weasel phrase is better. Uh, for this IGF, uh, and that phrase is the recent developments, uh, <laughs> uh, you might begin to think that the problem could begin with the citizen. The citizen could be the person whose rights have been infringed against. It's a very good and point. then if you were to structure these components, you might come up with a completely different uh, structure. So just, uh, Th and thank but you. I'm uh, very invested, very committed. We'll continue <laughs> with the this process. Very quickly. One on the labeling of the issue. You're absolutely right, and I didn't mention it. One of the fundamental exercises that we're trying to do is to find formulations that reflect the concern of all actors and do not presuppose a position or a solution. And so it's sometimes a, a, a lot of work. You're absolutely right. I mean, content takedown can be labeled otherwise. <laughs> the, sec the second thing is, uh, I would argue, though, that the user, not as individuals, 
but as um, uh, civil society uh, representatives can have a role in traceability and that actually in traceability there can be a dimension that we have not mentioned that is monitoring of uh, content takedown by uh, individual actors that are part of it. But it's a very good point. Um, yeah. Um, thanks, thanks, Sunil. Actually, I was thinking we might call it legitimizing transnational censorship. But um, I also think this is <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, No, no, no I, I, I'm joking. I think it's a good initiative. I completely agree with uh, what Sunil said, and I knew Malcolm Hachi would throw uh, a cat among the pigeons. <laughs> so my suggestion is, I like the building blocks. I think. Um, firstly, yes, I think Sunil's point, that also occurred to me, that there's an imbalance in how your triangular groups of stakeholders User can power. participate and influence this process. I also think that under platform operators, you really need to add internet service providers. In some countries, like in mine, in South Africa, we have a fairly effective ISP association that deals and processes these kind of requests that interfaces between service providers and users and that uh, via the national legislation. I think we are not all yet using the cloud, even though the cloud is very important, and we're not all using our mobile phones to access the internet, thank goodness. And then I think um, on three, on, uh, 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 on safeguards, I think beyond, um, I think accessibility there is, I think, extremely important. You know, safeguards are only meaningful if they have impact and if they can be used and if they are truly effectable, if, uh, accessible. If they just add legitimacy, uh -huh. they're not going to add... You mean um, if there's a, uh, uh, a stepping... There, there needs to be whole uh, layers of how information is made available, to whom, um, um, support for accessing those safeguards. So it's actually, I think safeguards in itself is, is a very complex area. Then um, I think there is one building block that's missing. And I think what I really like about your process is that you started with common problem identification. But I think it could only really work from my perspective in a, in a legitimate way if there are also some common principles. And if the, I'm not, you know, maybe the jurisdictional administrative, uh, I'm not addressing that division because I think it does, this process does mix them up. But you need compliance with existing legal framework and existing human, a human rights standards. And so maybe a, a seventh building block, which could be principles, um, very specific principles related to the specific problem that you are addressing, takedown uh, requests, and, and, and for example, and, and that these principles reflect both consumer law uh, um, issues as well as human rights law uh, principles. And I'll use it as an example, one of the recent developments. Not the very recent developments, but that's ICANN Brazil. The recent development, which is the mass surveillance exposure. And um, there's actually a set of principles that's been developed by some of the civil society exactly. groups in this room called Necessary and Proportionate, which are principles that we feel should be applied to surveillance. And a lot of governments that we've talked to actually can, like those principles. I, I can respond directly so to this. So I think this. that could be having such a set of principles agreed um, for, for every time you apply this model could make it more transparent, it could add more of a political statement um, to it, and I think would give it much more legitimacy. I, I, I fully agree, and as a matter of fact, I was talking with Brett Solomon uh, yesterday on the uh, necessary and proportionate, and we were actually mapping almost each of the 13 principles that they have developed with one of the different building blocks. So the articulation is not the seventh building block. It's there are some issues that are principles regarding the substance, and a certain number of their principles are actually process principles that are related to this. So the mapping is being done. But thanks for for reminding us, Patrick. Well, this is all working out great because I, the, my the point I wanted to make was to jump in on the informal processes and how important they are. Uh, as a recovering lawyer, I know from personal experience that we are sort of like hammers and like to see every problem. Nail. Uh, Sunil mentioned at the beginning whether or not this whole thing was a feature or a bug. I think it's a bug. It's <laughs> both a feature and a bug to most lawyers. And we need to keep that in mind. These are backstops. This, all, of this, all of these jurisdictional issues and these, these processes are really backstops. We need to solve the problems to the extent we can through, um, through informal processes. 
through principles and the extent that we can merge these two, I would argue, Bertrand, it's worth a seven principle. It's worth considering and, uh, and building into the plan. Okay. I, I would probably make it a, a, an overarching block, which is a, a connector with the exercises that are underway. Because no. Oh, no, 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 no. On the contrary, it's so much a good number that we have a, a logo that is an heptagon. So thank you. We were missing the seven one. <laughs> okay, so uh, good. That that's the result of the type of process. If there's support for considering that a seventh is interfacing with the principal thing, it's it's perfect. Um, it's a hit. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I got three, four points. So much is being discussed. One, I would encourage you and caution you to stay away from the international convention treaty. Do we need another one going that way? Not because it may not be a question that people should ask or should not ask. I don't want to get into that. Should but be the starting you, point. Well, you get pulled into a whole lot of politics, and, and so it'll, it, it might sabotage the process. So I want to caution you there, number one. Uh, number two, I think the principal idea is a good one. And you know, mapping with the best actors in the world, you know, which country has a judicial oversight over intelligence, maybe that's a good principle to start with. We'll see how many oh. stand up to that. <laughs> one, you know, recent events. The other is, I think it, it, uh, these sort of issues uh, tend to attract the most difficult issues first. So everybody wants to tackle the most difficult issue. And I think when you are discussing the principles, maybe start with what are the common grounds. I think that in this area, you will find that there's already cooperation between ISPs and people across the board because there are those things they agree with. When they see a phishing website, they know what's happening there. Absolutely. So start with the common grounds and then work your way towards the problematic areas. The other thing was, uh, a point was made by Mark, I think, you know, is it judicial, quasi-judicial, is administrative. I actually like what you're doing because it's, it seems to me to be forum neutral. If I'm in a developing country developing legislation, I can use this. If I'm doing an administrative process, process within a corporation, I can use this. And I think those principles applying to everything would be a better way. That, that will help in, in, in both. Because at eventually, if someone's going to have a dispute, you are going to end up at a court or at least a quasi-court, right? You cannot, and keep in mind, you cannot arbitrate criminal law. You can do it for civil, but you cannot do it for criminal. So, so it's going to be part of the process. So it's, it's, you're setting up a model, and I look at it as a model, not, not much, much more. One last, and so we have to be sensitive to courts, and we don't want to take that jurisdiction away. It'll never work in developing countries if you try to do that. And so, you know, where do we get the precedence from? I think, you know, uh, if, if you want to build examples of, of cases, they could be expert advice, which could be shared within countries before judges, etc. They could be called precedents if you want them, or expert advice. It's something that people would love to read if it's well written and it, it makes sense in the scenario or a case study. It could be used. I think me, for instance, I'd be happy to take it to our judges and say, well, you know, this is not a binding precedent, but this is an example of how, how a conclusion may be reached. The other is when you're talking about warrants, I want to be a little more specific. Uh, on safeguards, let be a little more specific. Drafting legislation in my country. The law enforcement didn't want the right of search and seizure to be limited by a warrant. They said, whenever we think there's due cause, we should be able to go in. But there was a fight on saying, well, no, you should have a warrant. And what should the criteria for each warrant be? For a criteria for arrest would be different. A criteria for search and seizure would be different. A criteria for a preservation order might be different. A criteria for production or real-time interception would be different. So thinking of how you elevate through the process depending on what the request is, may also be useful. But definitely supportive, and, and it's a great model that you're trying to work on. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Carlos, yes. Good. Of course, I was thinking that I had not paid attention to that. Uh, from uh, Faisal Hassan, uh, I should uh, delegate from Bangladesh, Dhaka. Uh, I'm reading out his comments right now. He says, thank you for organizing this excellent panel. Is very important. The question is when we talk about fair process on cross border spaces, is it quite appropriate to think of the process framework of the platforms first? The platforms have become so dominating in the internet these days that it is sometimes irrelevant to talk about the fair process for the other actors without ensuring that the platforms have a transparent fair process that considers cultural diversity and norms of different countries. Have we, made, have we made any progress in that since last year? Uh, I think 
in a, in a nutshell, without opening the, this question, it is part of the discussion of moving precisely the determination outside of the platform instead of asking basically the platform to become a quasi-judiciary. And, I, and I, when I see nodding from the platform, I think we, <laughs> we're heading in the, in the right direction. You need to go. So, Anne, if you want to make a, a, a yeah, brief I intervention, then I will come back to the list. Well, thank you very much for organizing this, this discussion. Just to say that um, the OECD Secretariat is supportive, and um, the building blocks, I think, are a very good starting point. And that um, if you could consider at some point coming to our members during yeah. one of our meetings to explain what you do, I think we can usefully relate this to other parts of our work. Do, do you cover the travel expenses? It's in Paris? Yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I need the reimbursement of two uh, metro tickets. <laughs> I could even invite you on my own money, okay? We do that with pleasure. Thank you. We're opening crowdfunding, as you see. Uh, I'm going back to the, li to the list. I uh, had Carlos, uh, David, the gentleman over there, Fiona, Merlia, and, and, and we, we will close. We're already there. My side very very quickly. Uh, I was about to to talk about the, the necessary and proportionate. Uh, so I think that uh, one access was in the in the workshop in Washington, by the way. That's great. And uh, one thing that is interesting here is for us to, to think about what's the best way to have this whole idea of uh, procedural principles inserted into the the framework that you guys are trying to to come up here. And uh, the way I was thinking about it uh, before Henriette's uh, uh, intervention was this idea that you have very substantive high-level principles, and then you have a bunch of examples for that, uh, like uh, the, the Internet Rights and Principles uh, Dynamic Coalition, the 10 principles from the CGIBR, and a number of other initiatives that end up drafting uh, those uh, declarations of substantive uh, principles. And on the other side, uh, you have the components. But it will be interesting to have something that would connect those substantive high-level principles okay. with the components. So that's okay. where the procedural uh, principles come up. Yes. And uh, if you take a look at the necessary and proportionate, we have uh, a great number of principles that definitely could be applied to that, mm -hmm. such as like legality, necessity, integrity, mm -hmm. uh, due process, transparency, public oversight. So maybe that would be a good idea for the, the next year of the Internet Jurisdiction Project to try to, to come up with uh, how's the best way to fit this discussion in the, in the framework that's already a very good start, but how could mm. we connect that? Because that could be something that could be attacked on the, that could be, some, that could be something that could be highlighted as something that is missing in the structure, which is those connecting principles. Yeah. That, that would be my major comment, of course. The ITS is pretty much uh, interesting to continue the, the debate. David. Thank you. Uh, one, we need the project to, to succeed. Two, um, as Jan said, conventions already exist, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We, we shouldn't lose time and energy on that. Uh, three, uh, not my, my idea, but I like it, and I, I, I mentioned it before. I think what we are looking for now is a kind of international body that could be responsible for those six components that I fully agree with. We, we need something that could do the authentication, that could do the transmission, traceability, etc., etc., uh, and we need it quickly. Because again, democratic law enforcement agencies need results, they need changes, they need us to do that. And um, uh, there are models that already exist, and I, I'm sure that we could find similarities with something like Interpol, for example. Just similarities. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it has to be a, a duplication of Interpol, but there are things that we can explore in the way Interpol works to try and, and see how we could cr propose the creation of something like that. And I do agree that international convention treaties take a lot of time, but at some point we governments need that to be 
able to work. Thank you. One quick comment regarding the expression an international body versus international bodies or components forming an international system is part of the discussion regarding how this is, can be uh, concretely implemented and it's part of the issue. Um, Anki. I just had one uh, very tactical point to make. Uh, you mentioned that this will go on for another year, so that the uh, entire process, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see some resolution at the end of it. But while you do that, um, as you work through the, uh, the session of meeting, uh, I think from the India meeting it was very clear, at least in the developing countries, it's very important to make sure that there's government representation on the table. Yes. Because if we do not have them, then we are not having a real conversation. And while some of these concepts may be well appreciated in the north, they're not equally appreciated in the south. So I think it's very important in terms of lifting, you know, the conversation across the world. That was one. The second thing is that there is, uh, as a short-term measure, but a very, uh, you know, important measure, we definitely need to address the MLAT infrastructure point. You know, I know everybody hates talking about it, and we all know that the system is broken. But this is something which is required as of like two years back, and it's not happened. So to the extent, where, particularly when you're having these conversations in the U.S., in D.C., etc., it's very important that we're raising this enough in, in conversations there. Okay. One, one quick point regarding government involvement. Uh, both Brazil and India were absolutely willing to participate. I mean, the government is willing to participate in this workshop, but there was one, the conflict with the main session, and two, the fact that one of the actors is only arriving tonight. Um, I had the gentleman over there, then Fiona and Marilia, and we I'm just trying to visualize uh, the outcome of this one. Would it be kind of a new convention that we're talking about, or we are talking about process design in each of these parts, or technical implementation for this implementation? I'm more keen on technical implementation because all these parts you are saying here are, are I'm looking are very close to technical implementation part. Even if you apply these parts to MLAT, I think MLAT will significantly improve this one. If we create a technical infrastructure which talks about authentication, which talks about uh, transmission, which talks about all these parameters, significantly the efficient process could improve with that one. Thank you. Um, I have Fiona. Sure. I just actually have a, a question that I hadn't really thought about until Malcolm's really interesting intervention, as always. And listening to the discussion, there's a lot of discussion about law enforcement and MLAT and governments and conventions and things like that. And maybe it'd be helpful to understand and uh, a clarifying point, which is these components that are here, I'd always understood, and maybe it was incorrect, that it wasn't just about governments being able to do these things. It was about anybody in your triangle or any other user thing. So if you're looking at users being able to start this process, assuming authentication is the first part of the process, I just find us talking a lot about MLAT and law enforcement and government. And is that the intent of the exercise? Or is it really to talk about how do all stakeholders do whatever this process or procedure may eventually come about, or multiple ones? That would be helpful for me to understand. And it was actually Malcolm's question that's made me start to think about it. The question of whether the uh, in the process, the initiation is exclusively public authorities, or so users and so on, is an element of the expansion of the system versus where we start from. There is a clear issue regarding the relationship between governmental authorities and platforms in another country and making sure that the users are protected in this interaction. Actually, the same building blocks apply pretty nicely to user requests uh, in, in the future as well. I just wonder, it's always the case after the fact that people think of these things but does the use of the word jurisdiction in people's mind automatically bring about the rule of law and government? Just like internet governance led to that as well, and I don't think that was the intent of the outside. I, I mean, just something to think about. Okay, thank you. Maria, uh, Malcolm, you wanted to? Yeah, I'm not sure I necessarily feel that the building blocks do apply equally in both cases. Um, maybe not, the, it was maybe a, a quick... If, a quick if, if this is an administrative process, decision that execution is going to be needed and there will be safeguards of abuse of process but the idea that this should happen has already been taken then the credentialing and the authentication side is crucial because you can't let anyone do that you've got to ensure that the decision has indeed been taken by 
whatever the process is designed to ensure that that decision is, is executed and a fair procedure for carrying it out occurs, if that's what this is about. But if this is about a process for deciding whether or not something should happen, then maybe, then indeed, it potentially could be opened up very much. You, you can look at it, you've got a complainant. That complainant might be a government, it might be a law enforcement agency, it might be a private individual or a company. Um, Welcome. About their rights. Uh, I, will, I, will, I think I will have to, to, to interrupt this exchange because of purely of, of time. It's an absolutely fundamental question and I retract what I was saying. I'm not sure that it applies exactly in the same way. We need to discuss when it applies in the same way and when it doesn't, if, if, I, if I may. Marilia and Linda, did you want to make a last, last comment? Um, thank you anyway for all of those who are waiting until well, very quickly, um, due to recent developments, we, the Brazilian actors, have been uh, called to ponder on a lot on fragmentation, and, and people tend to see fragmentation as some technical measures that have been uh, advanced by Brazil, such as the creation of the brick table, um, but also measures in terms of regulation. And I think that Brazil presents uh, an example of how the failure, or at least the deception with MLAT, has influenced the uh, regulation and, and, and may tend to foster fragmentation. Um, because uh, like in Marco Civil, they have introduced this provision uh, that says that uh, yeah, data centers should be, yeah, the location of uh, personal information of Brazilian citizens should be uh, stored in data centers in the Brazilian territory and not only that, uh, we did not have access to the, to the text, so we know for, from leaked sources that it goes uh, beyond and says that if one side of the communication is the Brazilian citizen, um, then the content of communication should be stored in Brazil, and if this content of communication is mirrored as well as elsewhere, then the Brazilian law should apply as well. And I think that this is a trend that not only Brazil, but other countries tend to follow as well after the recent development. So one thing that I would like to suggest, I don't know if the purpose of uh, the internet jurisdiction is more academic or it's more politically oriented and if it is politically oriented as well I think that in the next meeting we should make an effort to bring in governments and try to see how we can influence these measures that, are, that they are going to adopt and on your question regarding uh, other people we should reach out to um, I think that we usually overlook the fact that fragmentation does not only have to do with regulation, it, ha it has to do as well with interoperability. And uh, some people that I usually miss in this kind of debate are people that work with standards and that work with code and how we could establish a dialogue with them. So uh, if I would search for a priority for, for a group to reach out to, it would be on the technical community. Thank you. Two closing words. Uh, because we've already over time. One, the context of multiplication of national legislations that produce a de facto fragmentation that seems a short-term solution but is actually a long-term harm is exactly the reason why we're trying to make people, help people talk together because it's harming actually everybody. Uh, the, the second thing is an attempt at making a balanced response to the question of treaties or not treaties. We're calling that roughly a framework of commitments, and the goal is to try to identify new types of arrangements between the different actors, where potentially the countries can then embed some of the components in their legislative framework. The platforms can embed that in their terms of service. The uh, civil society groups can set up dedicated systems it's not per se a treaty, it's not a standard, it's not guidelines, it's a little bit of a hybrid system potentially that will take the form that actually the actors will want to give it. Uh, I don't think we want to focus on this at this stage regarding what the format is. This is why the expression that we've chosen is a very generic one, framework of commitments, and we'll see how it, uh, how it evolves. Thank you so much for the, uh, for the input. I wish I could have organized a whole day on this to get more input, but it was great. Thank you so much, and, and see you um, in Paris uh, soon. <laughs>